So I think we'll get kick started. Um, so good morning. It is morning. Afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Jet lag. <clears throat> so good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased to see you in an almost full room. Um, and welcome to today's session, the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs, a breakthrough model for equity and inclusion. And you would have heard Brad allude to some of the points that we're going to be discussing today in this morning's plenary. So my name is Nate Parker. I've been with JP Morgan, pronouns are he, him, his. I've been with JP Morgan now for 17 years and been so privileged to have been a part of this agenda as a gay job and day job from pretty much day one. Um, and then of course joined the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs it's just been a year, right? January. Just January, yeah. Um, as the Global Business and Program Manager. So, love my data, my controls, spreadsheets. That's, that's my life. So, we're really here today to share with you our journey since the office was stood up uh, last year. So, of course, lessons learned, um, and also share with you some of our thoughts for the future and where we are heading. But before we dive into that, let me uh, welcome the panel. So. I'd like to go down, Brad, first and introduce yourself. Sure. Brad Baumel. I, most of you hopefully heard me on stage before. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm our global head of LGBT plus affairs. I've uh, been with JP Morgan Chase for, in March, 30 years. Um, and I've had the privilege of knowing most everybody on stage, minus one, for at least over a decade. And how did that happen? I think we all met here. Um, <laughs> at one of the summits, and I've lost track of how many I've gone to. Um, and then, um, but everybody on this stage has been working in this agenda for some time, which is just amazing. So, thank you. Hi friends, I'm Violetta Dudov. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an ally. So thrilled to be here with all of you today and all of our friends joining us virtually from around the globe. Thank you for joining us and listening to our session. A little bit about me. Um, I've been um, almost as long as Nate at the firm, at JP Morgan Chase, 15 years. 10 of those years I spent um, in our corporate diversity and inclusion team and landed my absolute dream job with Brad in the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs last year, leading careers and skills. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Freire. My pronouns are, pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm the minus one. So I've known, <laughs> I've known everybody, every, everyone the least here in this room, um, in this, uh, actually in this panel. Um, I've been with the firm for over 15, year, 15 years now, and I recently joined uh, Brad's team at the office uh, as business growth lead uh, for the, you know, for, for, for the office. Uh, prior to that, I was a, uh, was heading the commercial banking efforts in Mexico City uh, for 15 years, in fact, and um, now I'm uh, transitioning into New York, uh, moving into New York and uh, getting my, my life started uh, with the, with, along with my, my, my job, my, my career, um, um, as we speak, literally. Over to... Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my first time in Vegas, I've had to be here with my boss, which uh, <laughs> basically means everything I've wanted to do, to do I just can't. So, we'll, uh, But um, my name is Thornwell Hembro, pronouns he, him, his. Been with JP Morgan for 17 years. My husband works at JP Morgan, so we, we really support a um, you know, family of LGBT+, which has been my experience. Uh, so I'm the Global Head of Community Development for the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs, which essentially means I look after all of our external nonprofit partnerships, advocacy, uh, large-scale public-facing events, things like that. So um, thank you for coming. Nice to see you all. Thank you, panel. So what are we here today's agenda? Um, we're going to start with Brad, who was uh, the first, of course, in the office, and just recap on some of the things we shared at last summit in terms of what what our life was like before the office, um, and then we'll turn to the other rest of the panel to talk about their journeys. I think all of us have been on personal journeys of growth, as with the office at the same time, um, and then we absolutely want to have plenty of time at the end for Q&A uh, to hear your comments and questions and to share with you. And as Brad mentioned in the plenary, it is a journey, and we're still you know, moving ahead on that journey. So, yeah, uh, as mentioned, Brad, we've been on this journey together 
and also individually for many, many years before coming into the office. But what was it like? What did you uh, find when you first started? So I guess I'd start with, it's probably similar to everybody's journey in the room. We had a ton of work going on, LGBT plus across the firm. We're a global firm, so we had things going on in every region, in every country, in every LOB. We did use Out and Equal, since we began with this journey, as an anchor point to try and set a little bit of like global priorities, but we operated in silos. And pretty much any chapter of Pride or the Executive Council or an LOB LGBT group could pretty much do what they wanted to do. And while that was amazing and it gave a lot of autonomy to the field, it wouldn't really ever get us far enough to truly close the gaps. We did a lot of great stuff, but it was a lot. And so one of the first things we did when we brought the office together was we brought all of that together. So, and we had great things going on. We really did. We had it in every line of business, in every state and country and region. And we didn't want to squash any of that, right? Because that is really important. What we wanted to do is work on one agenda, one unified strategy against common themes, and together we prioritize those things. So the thing I was really careful about was that our strategy was our strategy. It wasn't my strategy, it wasn't our strategy on stage. We brought leaders together from across the firm globally and together we agreed on what we wanted to do to truly change equity and inclusion. Great, thank you. And you mentioned there the unified strategy that we've worked hard together on to build, but could you just take us through that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key things that I think differentiates us at J.P. Morgan Chase so far, although I would argue we want everyone in the room following our lead, is what we've done is we've set up seven centers of excellence, so I'm one of seven, to cover all underrepresented groups. Women, black, Latino and Hispanic, disability and inclusion, military and veteran, Asian and Pacific Islander, LGBT plus. And we together agreed one strategy and this one strategy will be based on four pillars. I also should tell you, we're not part of HR. So I report to our chief diversity officer who reports to our CEO. So we're a business, running a business. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, and Nate's probably like growling because he spent years in HR. It's not that it, we don't value HR, we do. They're a huge component of how we're successful. We're just not an HR function. We're a business driven, it's built into our DNA as a firm. So the four pillars, which are really important, are careers and skills, those are our employees. Financial health, because we are a bank. These are our customers, our consumers who span the lines of business. That's our Chase Bank, our private bank, our individual people who do business with us and who we're trying to help have healthy financial lives. It's businesses, so LGBT plus entrepreneurs, founders, business owners, who I will tell you, get nothing, right? So you think about women, they get 1% of VC funding. LGBT women, less than half of that percent. Um, so businesses and then communities. And communities is broad, um, so Thornell's got a big job too, everybody does on the team. So in the community development space, we have advocacy, so where do we use our voice and how do we change things outside the firm? And as I spoke about in my plenary, partnerships, because there's no way any one of us can do this alone. So all seven centers of excellence are grounded against these four pillars. When we created the unified strategy as a global team, and there are 50 people on my extended leadership team, we together came up with 
programming, it's like sub strategies against all four pillars. And nobody anywhere in JP Morgan Chase can be working on something in the LGBT plus community without it laddering up to one of the sub strategies. And without us at the leadership team having agreed it was a priority for this year or next year or within our five year plan. Great. I do vaguely miss HR. Um, <laughs> you know, what's, what's fascinating having joined diversity as part of HR now is it's no longer a HR initiative. This is a business imperative. And that's been for me the you know, really obvious change that we've seen. So on a previous slide, we sort of saw all of these amazing groups doing work together. We now know the strategy, but how have you taken those groups into your, as you mentioned earlier, your extended leadership team? So we first understood that what existed was great, but not enough. So we have our communities of practice, and these are continually evolving. So we just spun up our latest one, which is our family network. And our family network covers parents of LGBT plus children, LGBT plus employees who's have family issues, coming out issues, or could be like cultural or wherever you are in the globe, LGBT plus employees who want to start families. So it's any aspect of family, it's a support network for them. Before that, we had our GGIEC, which today is called the GEC, our Global Expansive Council, Global Gender Expansive Council, who are doing truly phenomenal work, truly phenomenal work our Bi Plus Council and our Ally Council. So these are literally communities of practice leading parts of our strategy for those vulnerable parts of our community within the firm. Um, we had something called the Executive Council, but we've rebranded it the Executive Forum, very similar to the other centers of excellence. These are our senior leaders. We have 450 out managing and executive directors in the firm. That's Phenomenal, 450 globally. So they are our culture carriers, but they're also the mentors for our up and coming staff. We do amazing things with them. We have our LOB communities and several of our lines of business have spun up LGBT plus groups. Our Pride BRG, which is our bread and butter, right? There are 30,000 members of our Pride Business Resource Group around the globe, and they have been with us the longest doing amazing work and surround sound. We've built a partnership framework for nonprofits, multi-tiered, three tiers. I'm not gonna steal all of Dornell's thunder, and he's got a session on this later too. We've picked a couple to wrap in surround sound to maximize everything we can offer and they can offer for everybody in this room, for their members and for our employees. We brought all of this together and there's 50 people leading components of this around the globe who sit at my table um, and we drive the strategy together. Thanks Brad. So many of you may sort of see your organizations reflected in certain elements of this, but of course these are all volunteers. So as Brad mentioned earlier on, you know, they have day jobs and they have gay jobs. But how have you built out us and your, your global team? So yeah, the global team are those on stage. So these are not volunteer jobs. These are full-time roles. And we have staff on our teams and every year we grow. Now, I'll never be a team of 100. It's just not how we're gonna organize. We're eight today. We just got approved for three or four more for next year. And this has been, again, it's 18 months, right? So we're getting additional headcount each year. So this is a global dedicated team and it's gonna amaze you. Like many of us have been in the agenda for a long time, right? And I thought I was getting a lot done. Like every year I made time to do special stuff for our community. There's no way you can measure how much you can get done when you put every minute of the day against this. And so I think the core team have accomplished incredible things in such a short period of time, but again, not alone, right? It's harnessing the network of other leaders on a focused, prioritized agenda, and we've literally seen things take off in 18 months. Great, thank you. So that's a recap.
A uh, very short and sweet recap in terms of taking that and creating that unified strategy and really talking about those impact pillars. And so to double click into those, uh, we'll move now into exploring some of the journeys that my colleagues have taken with their respective pillars. And we're going to start with um, careers and skills. So Violetta, coming to you, could you just help us understand what is careers and skills in, in essence? Yes, careers and skills. Um, it is the biggest and most important of all of the pillars, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Of um, course. And quite seriously, um, the extended leadership team, uh, by council, GEC, Ally, um, all of that is internal people agenda, right? Um, or a lot of it is internal people agenda. So together, we drive culture, we drive inclusive policies and practices, healthcare, transgender inclusive healthcare, LGBT plus inclusive healthcare and benefits. Of course, you saw Hannah's video during the, the brunch um, session earlier. All of this is, is part of um, careers and skills. We also, within careers and skills, intentionally focus on attracting, hiring, development, promoting, and retaining LGBT plus talent. So we have intentional programming now in place around these. And that's where I'm saying it's huge, right? Because when you think about um, your typical corporation, there's armies of teams and departments re running each one of these. We are doing it all within the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs end-to-end -end talent management. It is also about allies and allyship and all of this from an intersectional lens. And the other important story, fundamentally important story about our people agenda um, and our talent agenda is our data story because data is super important. It's what allows us to hold ourselves accountable and that data story for LGBT plus has never been the same as for other diversity dimensions. We had to work very hard to create and build the data that allows us to manage, lead, and hold our managers and our lines of businesses accountable. So there is a beginning to this journey, a beginning that starts with um, Nate. And so I would like to turn now, Nate, back over to you to tell us a little bit about our data journey. Thank you. I'm like trying to hold in my excitement. I'm a data <laughs> geek, um, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I joined the company in 2005, and within a matter of weeks, I started to, to compile metrics on our Pride membership. So this was before our hot off the press 31,000 now. We just hit that this week, which is amazing. But we had like less than 3,000 Pride members towards the end of 2005. And I just sort of thought, you know, we're not tracking or measuring this. Let's start to figure out where we have Pride members. How can we increase our Pride membership? But really, that was all the data we had. Um, and I won't spoil the story here, but 17 years later, it's evolved quite a lot. But really, prior to the office, it was heavily in that. And of course, then we had this amazing uh, journey with Self-ID that, again, Brad mentioned in today's plenary. But it was still quite disjointed. Uh, we had Pride membership, you had Self-ID, the introduction of pronouns, but again, not unified and not really exploring this. What is the story? Where are our opportunities? Where is, in particular, the intersectionality with our other centers of excellence? So, exciting for me. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Data, not tech. Um, it was exciting for me. But there was a lot of opportunity there. So, I'm going to pause because I can talk a lot more about this today. But, Violetta, back to you to sort of share with us about the other before. The other before story. It, it, it's a great story, the before story. Um, and you heard again some of it uh, when Brad um, 
talked to us off stage um, this this morning. So we've always had a 100 uh, perfect percent score on the uh, corporate equality index. So work workplace policies and practices were in place. We also had an amazing Pride BRG and an LGBT plus executive forum. So we engaged our employees globally um, through Pride and the council and um, through Pride also engaged externally in the marketplace through our Pride parades. And we had an extensive agenda, events and programming for many, many, many years. Um, the other, the other uh, piece here of the before story and, and uh, some of you like me that have been in Summit now for a few years in 2016, we actually here at Summit um, shared um, that we were so proud of this. We had launched our um, global uh, building bridges training and that was a huge achievement. Uh, part of that before story. Another important um, like um, achievement was we had completely at that time overhauled our transgender, what at the time was called transgender guidelines for transitioning and affirmed back in 2016, this wasn't done back then, it was like super, super new, um, affirmed uh, gender identity and expression um, all gender restroom policy globally. We degendered our dress uh, uh, catalog, which we had in our branches. We established um, a single point of contact, a unit where um, transitioning could be supported, in the workplace could be supported uh, for our employees for managers, for HR, anyone that had a question can call in and shout out to Bank of America because they were actually, I think, the first to launch such a service back then. Um, so, so this is some of the really, really um, great story from before. We also had, we were also in Ramba, we were also in, um, we were also in uh, Out for Undergrad. My colleagues, that um, some of them that lead these programs are here today. So we did quite a bit on hiring, although we were not always talking to each other and we were not always aware that we are doing it because we're such a large corporation. And, and of course, at that time, we were doing that really hard work, painstaking work of bringing in you know, the um, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, the are you open at work questions um, into our HR systems and making that part of the DNA of our HR systems the same way that, you know, vets and disability and military status was part of that so that and marital status and, and race marital, and, and all of those other things that yes. we want to know everything about you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, because it's already there, and that is what has always allowed intentional programming for other um, minorities. Um, for us, this just there was no transparency. We couldn't do it in the same way. So building the infrastructure, that's part of the before story. It's also part of the now story. So Nate, I'll turn back over to you to tell us what's happening with our data. How long do I have? Um, no, I, I'm happy to talk to people afterwards about, about data and more data. But again, you know, we started this exciting, uh, long fought for self ID journey in about 2015, I think it was. And of course we had Pride membership. We had an executive forum who were beginning to kind of, by word of mouth, you know, have a list of their members. Um, but again, it wasn't unified. Where are we today? Um, I think through as Brad mentioned, this strong partnership with HR. You know, we don't sit in HR, but we are a strong partner, so I have access to the data that we need to inform our programming. But we now have a firm-wide scorecard, which incorporates self-ID data, but it also looks at what we call leading indicators of culture, because as Brad mentioned, we don't have that 100% completion rate but we don't want to wait for that. We need to start looking now at the data. What is it telling us? Where are these opportunities? And these leading, in, leading indicators of culture take into account pride membership, self-ID, open up work rates. Um, pronouns. Pronouns, yeah. Uh, executive form membership. 
all of these things that collectively give us a story that now enables us and empowers our partners in regional and line of business DEI teams to begin to scratch the surface and to understand where we're heading. This is an amazing, wonderful Excel spreadsheet. Um, but it allows us to now really go beneath the surface. We can explore it by country, by state, by business, by corporate title, and even the intersectionality with um, ethnic minorities and disability and gender to really understand where do we need to focus our attention. By letter of our alphabet, by like, yeah. it lit I love my scorecards. <laughs> we can look at everything for our community at a very low level of detail, almost. Um, and I'm sure you were gonna go there next. I still don't have name by name for every one of our out employees. I have it for a number of them. And by next year, I'll have it for every, if you're out. So if you're open at work, the disclaimer will be, then we're gonna use this information to help you advance in your career. So um, right now I have it for all of our senior leaders. I will have it for everybody, and we will be treated just like every other diverse community across the firm when they're talking about recruiting, when they're looking at promotion radar and looking at, is this a diverse slate? We will be in that slate. There will be set representation in every slate. So it, we've gone really far, and I have a ton of great data to inform our strategy, but we're not 100% done yet. And this is where, as far as we are advanced, there's so much more to do. And that's exciting for me. Um, but enough about data for now. <laughs> Vilesa, back to you for the rest of the area. I'm just going to say this is so exciting to me because this is where the rubber meets the road, right? That's when we can start setting hiring goals, promotion goals, the same way that we've been doing for years, right, for, for other communities. Um, so that's key. So if you've ever wondered why is it, you know, how do, how do I sell this value proposition? How do I get, you know, my self-ID rating up there? This is part of the narrative. This is part of that story. Yeah, and it's showing up in the results. Like, the, it's kind of amazing. Last year when we did managing director promotions, so in 2021, mm -hmm. I remember three yeah. from the LGBT plus community. I know that there were more, but that's how many we knew. This year, 12? 12. And still not enough, right? But exponential growth. So what's next year look like? Yeah. So, so part of the today's story, and I, I wanted to first talk about our amazing sort of next level um, healthcare benefits and services, but I'm going to just keep on um, this trajectory because it has to do with the data. So where our hiring strategies became more intentional is that now there is that data that helps us put goals in place. And um, it becomes a different narrative. You know, when you can talk to your recruiters and you say, well, I want 7% of my interns to be LGBT plus this year. It makes a difference in how we approach hiring and um, recruiting. So, so this is sort of the next level and more of this, right, that we want to, to do in the future. But here this year, because it was also still a formational year, um, what we did is we, we established for ourselves um, a global talent pipeline forum where I am joined by my colleagues in campus recruiting graduate and undergraduate. My colleagues are here with me today, Blake Johnson. I know you're here somewhere in the room. Jade Carter, I see you right there sourcing. So it's, it's not, you know, hiring is not like just hiring. There's many pieces of hiring that you have to bring together. And again, for other communities, this story is well known. You know, there's mature strategies in place. For us, we are putting it together, we are doing it. And, and it's been a very, very exciting year in this respect. So around the table are also our early talent development program uh, managers. What that allows us to do, we are a multinational corporation. There's best practices here and there and everywhere around the world. But what this has helped us do is bring it all together around the table where we can share best practices, learn from each other, and really scale. So it's starting to take off. 
it's not just an early talent development program for transgender individuals in India. Now it's in the US, now it's also in Argentina. This is just this year, this is just 12 months. So what does the future hold? More of that, bigger and better. Yeah. So that's the recruiting piece, right? Um, on talent development, so when you think of the progression, right, you have attracting, hiring, and then you get this amazing talent, but how do you develop this talent? What can we put in place? And again, our community in the past being um, in invisible, right, not, 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 no transparency, we couldn't be intentional. This year, we actually just launched our first um, career development program. Anyone can join, but the program is designed with LGBT plus in mind, and it addresses the specific needs of our community, specifically things around imposter syndrome, um, you know, learning to really like share your story, the power of your story, leverage that to lead with authenticity. So we just launched the pilot. We got. 400 people through the pilot. Brad doesn't think that's enough people. I think it's amazing for the first ever pilot My bars that are we really launched. High, yeah. He's never satisfied, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> so next year we are going to we are going to scale this. Um, to go back, just um, Hannah, right there you are. Um, back to our benefits, right? All that great work we've been doing for a number of years that really took off, and and it all happened. All the, we reap the fruits, right, of that labor that started two, three years ago this year. So included health and um, the inclusive health care benefits that we now have. Um, one thing that Brett also highlighted, um, but I just want to spend a second on this, is the concierge uh, service that we have through um, included health. It is amazing. It is something that allows people to get the the their questions answered and the health care that they need without the need for outing themselves half a dozen times, talking to HR, talking to benefits, trying to figure out what benefits we even have, right? So that's, that's the important thing there, um, being able to get the care that you need with dignity without having to out yourself. So that was on benefits. One more thing that I wanted to highlight, well, a couple of more. Um, allyship program, we've been trying to stand it for seven years since the, I don't know what workplace service this was. Sir, um, well, we learned from Bank of America Bank on of this America, one too right? here, here A at number Summit. of years yeah. ago. So yep. Holly Yarborough, wherever you're out there in the audience, kudos. An amazing beta, uh, beta test uh, we just did and launched uh, our pilot in Texas and we'll be scaling that next year. And um, the only other thing I wanted to mention before I, I pass over back to you, Nate, is uh, we also did, um, I think, a really um, amazing job with um, our Trans 101, Trans 102 training, which we now have. Bi 101, non binary 101, like digitizing all of our training, making it self service for any employee in the firm on top of the personalized things. We just launched that digitally accessible now anywhere, right, in, in September, um, in addition to our build, building bridges training. And off of that, what that helps us drive is culture. So pronoun adoption, all of that messaging, marketing, internal communication about the importance of pronoun adoption, the importance of self-ID adoption, it all kind of works together. So before I hand over to you, Nate, this time I'll really do it, but I just wanted to mention, if you're excited about this kind of work, if you like what you're hearing today, we're actually hiring. I do have. <laughs> That's a plug. Now she's going to hand it over. And again, it's literally showing up in the results. And I know you'll probably come to the self-ID meeting tomorrow if you're interested in self-ID. But like we, I mean, I don't think anyone is near where we are. We're going to hit 5% soon. And 5% of our total employee population being LGBT+, plus, that's massive. It's, I mean, it's not what I want. I want to be 10%. I want to be 15%, 21%, Gen Z. But 5% is double what a lot of like the people I speak to are at. 
And that's all through what we're doing. Great, thank you. And I promise you it's not me. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, I mean, of course, where we're heading, you just heard that, those story points, um, and come and find out, be a part of that journey. Um, but let us uh, move on to another of our impact pillars, which is financial health and wealth creation. And um, actually going to come to you, Thornal, first um, to share with us a bit about what, what, what is financial health and wealth creation? Sure. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but I don't think it will surprise you that 9% of LGBT plus adults in the United States are unemployed. That's double, more than double the number of uh, non-LGBT plus people. 22% of LGBT plus adults in the United States are living in poverty. So, you know, that, that's really alarming. And what we want to do with this particular pillar is somewhat ride the rails of um, our Advancing Black Pathways program. If you haven't seen our $30 billion racial equity commitment, you should Google it because it's phenomenal. But essentially, it's all about creating education and awareness and financial literacy for LGBT plus people, specifically those most at risk in some of the most underserved communities across the United States and globally. So financial literacy, education, this is at its core. Great, thank you. And I'm sure we can all appreciate the double hatting, triple hatting. So Thornal, of course, you, um, we don't yet have a dedicated pillar lead for this, um, but perhaps you can sort of share with us uh, this slide. So kind of what, if, what was it like before uh, you took on the mantle of this, where we are today and the exciting opportunities ahead? It's super exciting and you know the, the reality is, is that today we don't have a dedicated person leading this particular pillar. Brad's uh, working the overtime so I'm doing the best I can but we have some really fantastic colleagues across the United States who are volunteering and jumping in to do this. So before the Office of LGBT Plus Affairs, literally no, no real dedicated campaign to this, nobody working full time. And uh, what that meant for us is that we had to come in and start from scratch. Um, but the really good news there, and when I alluded to advancing back pathways and our racial equity commitment, across a lot of our Chase branches in the United States, we have what we call community managers. So essentially these are full-time roles in some key locations across the United States where these community managers go in and, and link into the, their local communities and serve them, find opportunities to provide them financial literacy, education, access to tools, etc. Uh, also before the office in terms of the customer and the client, we had no dedicated uh, marketing program or campaigns where we would speak to that community externally and you know, uh, represent them, show them ways that they could see themselves and uh, that, that's ultimately what we've been missing since before the office. Thanks, Sorry, slideshow <laughs> issue. So we were looking at the financial health slide up here, but it wasn't on the screen. So now it's up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you so nothing I said made sense? Is there no, a... <laughs> Hopefully everybody was paying attention to Thornal and not Nate. And I'll just... <laughs> I could see confused faces, but I don't know if it was my accent or... Was... <laughs> Sorry. Definitely. Again, I wasn't touching the buttons. <laughs> I wasn't. Thank you so much, Thornal. Yeah, so this, um, yeah. Is th this and the business growth pillar, which you'll hear about, are critical to our strategy. And you might think, because I said we're running this like a business, that it's about finding new customers. It's not. No. Mm -hmm. We'll benefit from it in the long run if we do. It's about providing opportunity. It's about getting to our community and giving them what they need to thrive. And, you know, hopefully some of them will see like, why wouldn't I want to bank with J.B. Morgan Chase? But that's not our goal. Our goal is to get to our community and let them thrive and actually reach their potential. So, yeah. Great. I'm scared to press the button. <laughs> but um, on that point then, so business growth and entrepreneurship, has it changed? It, oh, <gasps> scared me. So, Raul, coming to you yeah, then to sure. share with us, um, what is business growth and entrepreneurship? And of course, recognizing that you are, if memory mass serves me, seven weeks into? Seven weeks. Yeah. yeah. So, um, tell us your story and, and help us understand this, this pillar. But wait, he was a commercial banker, so well, like he kind of knows the space a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, Head stop. I, and I'll I, and I say, my gay job then was leading 
co-leading uh, Pride Latam. So, so it, it does all tie in at some point. So, and and that's how how I you know ended up uh, here. So, um, I'd say for for so one thing I'd uh, I, I'd like you to you know to to share. I'd like to share with you two of my you know guarding guarding you know guardrails. So one of them is intentionality and the other one is intersectionality. I think those are two key concepts as as I've been you know approaching business growth and entrepreneurship for um, you know for, for as a pillar. So before before the journey was really uh, I think you know I, I need to thank my my you know my uh, co-leads here because they were actually carving out of their time uh, to run uh, some of these, um, you know, programs and, and initiatives. So it was a massive, uh, massive undertaking. Um, so you think of that as being run in isolation, but that, but that also meant that they were foundational, you know, as, as far as the strategy and what we're thinking in terms of what business growth should be in the future. Um, the to Brad's point, to Brad's point, the other thing that I, that, I, that I like to think of is that we're being intentional in in terms of bringing opportunities to you know to our community so that they can th we can thrive as a, as, a, as a community, irrespective of where we sit in you know in terms of the wealth continuum, if you will. So it could be a mom and pop shop, it could be all the way to, you know, uh, asset, wealth you know uh, asset wealth management clients, and for example, you know, uh, bringing or assisting, or even creating a pipeline of, um, you know, executives at a corporate level that are board ready, for example. So it, it does have, you know, mul multiple dimensions. Um, what are we doing today? So, um, stepped into the job, I don't know if Olga's here, so shout out to Olga, because the associate that I that works with me actually stepped in the same day that I did, uh, a couple hours apart. So uh, shout out to her. Um, and then you know, being being you know stepping into a role as a full time role, you know, really you know gave me the opportunity to to kind of think in, you know, to think deep into what the needs are. Um, you know, we are, uh, we, like I mentioned before, I basically received initiatives that were partially, you know, uh, on the flight. So, you know, we, you know, part of our, um, our, our first tasks were, you know, were really to implement what, you know, those programs were. So, for example, you know, we launched back in August a program with uh, our partners at NGLCC. Uh, so that's the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. Um, it's, a, it's a national program to not only, on one hand, coach businesses, um, you know, LGBT, LGBT businesses, but also to help um, be, uh, you know businesses, you know, get the, those those business sorry businesses certified. So you know, key key to our you know core strategy. Then um, you know we also um, you know worked on. Work streams. You know, we were thinking of you know how do we how do we think of you know what are the pillars of, of the business growth strategy, and we came up with actually we defined five so five strategic sub pillars. One of them is clearly business enablement, which has to do with coaching and ensuring that you know we're providing um, businesses all the tools that they need to thrive, basically. Uh, then market penetration, of course, we want to, as business enablers, we want to bring in, you know, as much res referrals or clients as possible to, you know, the lines of business of the bank. Then uh, supplier diversity, this is uh, one of, you know, as, as we ha we're a massive company, our diverse spend is relatively small, so we need, you know, in, especially when, when it comes to, uh, to LGTB businesses, so we want to make sure that we take a look at that. Um, you know, as part of the strategy. Then the other one, and as my colleagues have, have also mentioned, is data. So how do we, how do we handle data? But not only, you know, the obvious one would be, okay, where are, where, where are our, our clients? What, what's demographic? What, what are their behaviors? It's also about being intentional about, you know, driving programs. So are we, are we using the KPI, correct KPIs? Are we, are we ensuring that we make the most out of that investment? And uh, so, so just being intelligent and intentional about, you know, things that we want to do. And then um, the, the last one is about corporate directors, which is, 
you know, in, in this, in, the, in, in you know, our, our thoughts are really creating a pipeline of um, corporate ready, execu executive level, sorry, executive level ready directors uh, that could be ready, sorry, at the board level. Sorry, I was sorry, a bit of that. One so, th yeah. Sorry, Raul. Yeah, One on. of the things Raul said that's really important that I'd like to touch back on is the um, second work stream around um, the LOBs. So while we are a business and we are helping our community to reach their financial and life goals, um, we also have a number of lines of business that are in the business of banking. So this is an absolute collaboration with them, right? So. When we roll out coaching to LGBT plus entrepreneurs through NGLCC, we're doing it with business bankers using their baked curriculum because they've got decades of experience teaching entrepreneurs how to grow their business. So, and again, it's not, we absolutely need to find customers. We want to provide what we've got to others to help them reach their goals. And so we're in tight partnership with each of our lines of business on every single program that we do, leveraging their decades of collateral and their institutional knowledge to finally get to our community, much like they've gotten to other communities for a long time. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, Brad, because it's really about creating um, an ecosystem, if you will, of you know connecting dots, you know connecting the dots. So bringing bankers, bringing the community, bringing you know local NGLCC affiliates, so that you know they can all meet and hopefully you know uh, uh, well you know create a relationship. That's really all what we can do at this point. So um, so that's essentially where we are now, and where where we're heading is you know we really I really want to get you know more. Um, you know, intelligent about, you know, around data. So, for example, uh, Brad mentioned uh, bankers and, and other sales, uh, sales unit, you know, uh, I'd love to see, for example, uh, scorecards updated to, to ensure that we're, you know, really tracking, you know, all these diverse businesses and, you know, things like that. So it's really, data is a big word here and, you know, there's so tons of uh, works, work to be done. The other, the other point that I'd like to, to make is about sustainable because that ties to the point about being intersectional. So we cannot do this alone. And I think we, you know, this is a message that has, you know, been mentioned, you know, has been mentioned a couple of times. <clears throat> you know, we do, we do need our partners not only internally, but also externally. And in addition to that, you know, we need to, br to make sure that we um, partner with our other, you know, with the other, um, uh, sorry, with the other, um, Diverse uh, communities w within the bank, so that we you know we can we can make sure that uh, you know we're leveraging you know all the resources properly, and that we make this an effort that's sustainable over time. Otherwise, I don't think it's you know it's going to to be you know very much long lived. And then at the end of the day, and I think I'd like to th at least think that you know we want to position J.P. Morgan Chase as a, as a financial. Um, financial institution of choice for LGBT businesses. So definitely that's um, where we are heading. And I turn it over to you. And yes. just seven weeks, by the way, just to <laughs> reiterate that. Thank you, Raul. And then for the last um, pillar, uh, back to you, Thornall, on community development. If you could share with us, again, as like Violetta, you've been in seat for about a year now. Um, but what is it before, today, and where you're heading sure. before we move to Q&A? Absolutely. And I'll get through this quite quickly because I want to make sure we've got time for questions as well. And um, the other reason I'll go through it quickly is because tomorrow at 4.30, I am running a session specifically on what we call our surround sound uh, model. So um, I'll get to that in a second when I talk about today and the future. But before the office, essentially, um, our pride ERG was running all the partnerships globally, right? So. I would say that whether it's partnership framework, whether it's advocacy, whether it's community engagement, it was very reactive. So um, the fantastic work of Pride globally, all of our 30,000 members, when they had a local relationship with a non-profit, a civil society organisation, they would just jump in and start supporting them. They couldn't make financial grants. We obviously, excuse me, we obviously have corporate responsibility to do that. But they, they linked arms with local organizations and they supported them. But there was no real structure to that, there was no real strategy on who we would partner with and why. So today we've changed that. My good colleague sitting with us, Herman, who works for me in London, basically he's helped me build 
a partnership framework, and that is where we're really assessing these relationships. We had over 200 non-profit relationships globally. We're rationalising those, trying to make sure that when we do strike up a new partnership, it's for really strategic reason, reasons. The other thing we've done today is surround sound. That's where we take an ED or an MD level employee, we assign them as a relationship manager, and they run that non-profit relationship from end to end. Advocacy, I think we could all agree making public statements in support of LGBT plus rights is extremely difficult, especially in today's climate. So that's something where in the past we weren't really particularly well linked with our government relations team. We would make public statements very, and very reactionary, but today we've been way more strategic about it. We meet with the head of government relations in North America every month. We go through issues for the community and we work with them to come up with a future plan on public statements. Where are we going? In the future, really, it's a full global team of community development leads in each region being able to speak with fluency why they've got particular relationships and what they're doing with them. Um, advocacy, a clear set of criteria for where and where we might, you know, where and why we might make a statement. Um, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. I, I think the thing I'd add on to that is much like we've all done throughout our careers, LGBT plus is leading the way. So we, I, I don't know where all of you are on your journeys in your firms, but I think pride set the stage at J.P. Morgan Chase for all of what the BRGs became. We were ahead of everybody else. On partnership framework for the seven centers of excellence, the, the work we've done to really strategize around how do we take 150 partners that we dabble with around the globe and really create a tiered framework for evaluating them granting money to them, doing in-kind service, all seven centers of excellence are now following this framework. Mm -hmm. So like historically, we are still leading the way and hopefully at some point, the other six centers of excellence will be chasing us. <laughs> Thank you all. So, is Q&A right? Yes. So, would love to um, take a few comments or questions from the audience. And we've got microphones around the room, so yes. Ramon and Olga have mics. So oh my gosh. Lots of hands up in the okay. back around the room. Yeah. And we could stay afterwards, and we've got lots of other sessions. If you could stand up and just let us know your name and where you're from. Hi, Elise Colomer Cheadle, pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm from Outright International. Um, the pillars are really interesting, and, and you can clearly see the verticals. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're ensuring integration uh, horizontally mm -hmm. across the verticals? And I'm th I can think of several examples, but you know, looking at your employee base or your businesses, and then looking at the small business development and the community partnerships, let's say a nonprofit, a global mm -hmm. nonprofit that's helping micro enterprises. How do you connect the dots and how are you measuring impact on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the horizontal level with these pillars? Excellent yeah, it, it's question. an excellent question. So I, I think first and foremost, within the pillars, there's a lot of structure and the seven centers of excellence each have leads that c meet across the seven centers to cover the individual pillars. Then across the pillars, what we've found is that there's a lot of commonality between them. And so in many of the COEs, um, community development and financial health are being led by the same people and there's like cross integration between them much like thornell has been doing in our agenda uh, we're a pretty tight team maybe a hundred of us ish globally 120 across the seven coes we spend a lot of time very intentional across um, thinking about uh, much like corporate board directors or are grooming like EDs and MDs for board seats or entrepreneurs that we've got entrepreneurs in our own midst that, that have started their own businesses, bringing them in to help us think through. So, so I don't say we're there yet horizontally, um, but, there, but there is a lot of work already in play to ensure that we're literally thinking across for the community in a very intentional way. And, and I'd, add, I'd add to that that you know some examples would also be like the Centre in New York, for example, mm. the LGBT Plus Centre. So we've delivered financial literacy um, sessions to them. So that's the community development, working with non-profits, feeding financial health and wealth. 
And then in the UK, just like us, it's a, a, an organisation similar to GLSEN, so a youth-focused organisation. We're providing them early career preparedness training and leadership training, so that would be more along careers and skills. So yeah, how, Perry Ferry is the same way. Well, right. We're in India, we're, we're on, we have 30 so far. We've hired interns. Um, half of them have become full-time employees, where we're first training them on what it's like in corporate America, then bringing them in-house and letting them have internships with the firm. And on our first cohort, we hired 90% of them fully, and we're in our second cohort right now. And so that's community development and careers and skills, like literally fueling talent into the organization. And so, oh, yeah, sorry, no, please. I was just going to say, and even with our business skills and um, uh, pillar, the programming that we do with the Chambers of Commerce, mm -hmm. these are centers where the local LGBT plus community gathers. So there's an opportunity there, and not just you know to meet with the entrepreneurs and founders, but also to talk to the LGBT plus community and offer right that education um, and jobs um, that 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 we bring to the table. For the and, and this is do. the core team here, right? So we spend. Like, you know how you have team meetings with your team, maybe once a week, once a month? We meet three times a week. Three times a week. Yeah. Just those of us on stage. Mm -hmm. Just so that we're getting it right across the pillars. Right. Thank you. So, Olga, if we could come to you, I think, for the, the virtual room. Yes, hi, Rebecca York, out in equal staff, they, them pronouns, and I've got questions from our virtual audience. Um, with facing today's huge systems of injustice and inequality, what would be one small thing that you would suggest we could do to feel part of the fight and not feel alone or hopeless, either at work or in community? So, yeah, that's great. I'll bring Hannah on stage and help me with this. Um, so I'll take like the trans, no, no, it's fine. No. Yeah, I'll take the, trans, <laughs> the transgender community as an example, or the gender expansive community as an example. I mean, there's a lot of really bad stuff happening right now across the United States and the world. Um, I think the UK is just as bad right now, if not worse. I think we listen to our employees. Like we, that's why we, the GEC exists to feed all of that information into us and to let us think about what we can do collectively to uplift our employees and get into the communities and help them as well. So in the GEC space specifically, one of the things we've done recently um, across the US, and I don't think this is all like publicly announced yet, is we've granted some nonprofits in some very difficult states, Ohio, Florida, Texas. And these are tiny little nonprofits that are out there trying to help youth and their families. We've granted them to help. So, and then we've taken our communities within those locations and offered our employees, and we have massive employee populations in each of these states to help, to do volunteer work. So we're fueling money into them to help these families, so we're impacting the community in a positive way and we're giving them our people for whatever they need to feel, so our people feel good and the community feels mm -hmm. as good as they can in these uncertain times. So one of many examples of things we're trying to do to impact both inside and outside the firm. Thank you, yeah. and um, I know we don't have enough time for other questions and this counter is about to go into red, but I will just say, um, of course, thank you all so much for joining us, for us to share our journey with you today. Um, do visit our website. The QR code is on screen. For those joining us virtually or not, you know, download the app and contact us on Pathable, on LinkedIn, and we would absolutely be really happy to speak with you outside the room um, and continue some of this conversation. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, panel. You. Have a great summit. <laughs>